everyone, and welcome to the Buchanan Area Senior Center. Woo! Thank you so much for coming out today. We do appreciate you so much. And it's such a thrill for us to offer these kind of programs, to educate you, to give you information, and just have some fun with it. So I would like to introduce you to Mr. Gary Lang. He yeah, me on the mister. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 He um, actually yeah. owns the biggest little baseball museum that is located downtown Three Oaks. And I'm sure he's going to give you some more information where you can find that at. Mm -hmm. But really do appreciate him. As you can see, he has a lot of things that he's brought today that we get to see as well. We get to hear and learn. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Gary. Thank Thanks you, so everybody. Thanks so much, Diana. Thanks for asking me to be here. And thank you all for being here. Um, I wasn't a great player. I could feel pretty well, but I always said my batting average was somewhere between my weight and my IQ. Oh. <laughs> and I, yeah, I graduated at 145, so you can figure that out. Um, is, this, is this thing on? Oh, on the side, there's the on button. Yep. Okay. So we, we are on. Um, and a few years ago, I, put, I loved the game. And I loved it when I was growing up. I, uh, I still love it, what it does, especially for young people, um, but I decided to open a little baseball museum on the second floor of the library in Three Oaks. This is the old Warren building, and you probably recognize it, and uh, the car is a little uh, older than the ones <laughs> we used before, but uh, Mr. Warren, just as a little sidetrack history, was one of the third largest landowners in the country at a time. He made gazillions of money, and Three Oaks was a company town from the late 1890s in through the early 1900s with a product called Featherbone. He took turkey quills, split them, removed the pith, wrapped it in thread, and made a material that was replaced whalebone. It was stiff, but it, it was a great material. And it was mainly used in corsets, bustles, high collars, wow. stays, and it was sold all over the world. This was his first office building, but he had offices in Paris, New York, London, everywhere. And uh, as I said, they built this, I think, 1903. And uh, our museum is, is right here behind that double window in a small room. Um, but he was buddies with Teddy Roosevelt, Warren was. And at the time when Teddy Roosevelt was doing the national park system, Mr. Warren set aside the land that was Warren Dunes, and Warren Woods. And again, third largest landowner in the country. Um, but that was his office building. It's now our library. And uh, I made a nice little sign for that window up there. Uh, baseball museum here. And uh, I'm thankful to uh, Artifacts of Bridgman for that. And in 1911, Shortly after this building was built, there were five newspapers in Three Oaks. There was no internet, really? uh, but that, that is how they, that was, picture was taken in front of that building. That's awesome. And which one are you? Uh, that's not me, <laughs> but I live next door to this guy right here, Lord Schrader. Oh, that's awesome. When I was growing up, he was a gentleman in the neighborhood. <laughs> biggest, I mean, this presentation, the first half will be about the biggest little baseball museum, my take on baseball. We'll take a little break and then we'll go into Negro Leagues and honor Black History Month and I have a presentation about that as well. On the outside of the museum, that's how we got around in the baby boom. You had a bike, the mitt was on the handlebars, and if you saw a kid who had a bike that didn't have a mitt on it, you'd wonder, what's wrong? Why didn't that kid have a mitt on his handlebars? Everybody did. The ball was wedged between the fender there and the oldest kid usually carried the bat because he could steer with the bat on the, on the handlebars. There's the Christmas tree for the biggest little baseball museum, <laughs> just on the outside entrance. And uh, I brought this picture. At the turn of the century, just after that, every town had a team. Every town. I'm sure there were teams here in Buchanan. I know Dayton had a team that I have a picture of. The Three Oaks Greens, this is taken at Dewey Cannon Park in 1910. The, new uh, the 1932 Three Oaks Greens, one of the powerhouses of the area. and. When I was growing up, I knew some of these gentlemen uh, when they were in their 70s and 80s. The 1930 New Troy Grays. You, some of you remember Jerry Schaefer, that's his dad right there with the newsboy hat on. Uh, the Lakeside Aces had a team. And people worked hard. Monday through Friday, Saturday, they did chores around the house. 
Sunday, they went to church, had dinner, and then they went out to see their town team. And it was a big event, huge event. So that's the town team part, but the little museum that I have tells stories. I have a, a lot of small exhibits in big print that tell nice little stories. Who was Bill Doak? He was a pitcher for St. Louis, Brooklyn, and C Cincinnati. Spittin' Bill Doak was his nickname. He was one of the last <laughs> grandfathered spitballers in. It was outlawed in 1920, but every team who had a spitball pitcher, they could still throw it until they retired. They were grandfathered in. He had a 1920 patent with Rawlings to put a web between the thumb and first finger. There didn't used to be a web in there on the glove. And he's the guy that put that web in there and it changed fielding forever. And this is the web we're talking about right here. It used to be just like a farm glove. I collected a bunch of gloves because when I was coaching Little League, Kids would show up at practice, and it's clear they hadn't played any catch. And the only way they could catch it was if they held their glove out and I threw the ball into the glove. So I took that glove away and I gave them an old flat one that I bought, and they had to use two hands. And I used that to buy a, a slew of mitts. This is the first mitt I ever found. It was, it was the start of the collection. I was coaching Little League. Uh, I was driving. I discovered it at the intersection of US 12 and Cleveland Avenue and Galeen. It was just sitting there waiting for me, July of 1977. I stopped the car and picked it up. It was an Al Kaline model. Grab them, just like that. Um, we've had area big leaguers. Newsflash the first area big leaguer was Harry Niles from Buchanan, Michigan. All right. He was born September 10th, September 10th in 1880. He played for the St. Louis Browns from 1906 to 1907, the New York Highlanders in 1908, the Boston Red Sox from eight to 10, and he finished playing in 1910 with the Cleveland Nats. This Harry Niles card is a reprint of its tobacco card issued from 1909 to 1911 in what is known as the T206 set. This is a display at the museum. I also use QR codes which you've seen more of. If you watch the Super Bowl, you saw the one bouncing around like a poem. You use your smartphone. I'm not real good at this either, um, but you flash onto that and it will take you to a website that I have set up to reflect where that goes and you will learn more about Harry. So uh, the first guy was from Buchanan. What was his name again? Harry Niles. Niles from Buchanan. Niles <laughs> yeah. Do you recognize the name? Thank you. Yep. Um, there's another picture of him right there with the 1906 St. Louis Browns. First major leaguer in the area, but we've had others. So we see a southpaw, or what do you call him? Lefty, around? yep, southpaw, yeah. yep. This guy almost made it to the bigs. And he's also a Buchanan. Buchanan guy. Moses Kyles, my friend, was drafted by the Texas Rangers in June 1978. Um, he was at Western when I was there. He played two years of baseball and basketball there, and then went to Albion for two years, got his bachelor's degree. He returned home to help run F.S. Carbon and make a difference in his community. Many of you probably know him all. And I'll tell you, when I was at Western, I was at the bottom of the hill, what we call the hill, and I was going up the hill, and that's about a, a quarter mile. And I saw this guy walking just like this, and that arm was swinging, and I, and I was a quarter mile away, but that's Moe's walk. And I said, that must be Mo," and it was. Well, we've been friends a long time. Uh, Ron Reed from La Porte, graduated from there in 61, pitched in the bigs, Chris Knapp, 1971 grad on Lakeshore. Uh, Dave McMurray on the left from St. Joe, hit a home run in his first at bat is better known as a minor league manager. He's done that for years. And Dave Gumpert uh, pitched at South Haven. And these two guys have, have been to the Biggest Little Baseball Museum a couple times and put on a nice program and, and talked and told stories. And baseball stories are, are terrific. And I, I, I'm assuming, I'm sure I'll have them back again. Um, these guys graduated from River Valley. Jeff Petrick on the left. Uh, just had a cup of coffee in the majors. I went to Milwaukee to see him pitch 
uh, the game of the week against the Red Sox in the 80s. And Matt Manti, who fell into baseball at just the right time for relievers, the importance of relievers, and the drummed up value of relievers. And he's, he's been in, was injured on and off, did a nice job in his career. I think the last contract he signed was for $22 million. Then he got injured, and of course, it's guaranteed money. <laughs> he's, he's done well. So, did you know, is Pat Peter related to him? Pat is Jeff's uh, mother. Oh, wow. Yeah, yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Is she a member here? Yeah, yes, yeah, she is. She plays cards. Another local story uh, Chief Justice Supreme Court John Stevens uh, had a place in uh, uh, Harp Lakeside. And uh, he famously told that he saw Babe Ruth call his shot when Babe Ruth was up and he said, I'm going to hit the next pitch right out there. And he did. He was at that game. Oh, wow. I, I got contacted uh, several months ago to come and look at this. Um, piece of memorabilia from that game. These are all reproduction pieces, but it's a nice thing, the provenance, it was owned by him and such, but uh, um, just a little local history for you there. Little League, yes. the best time, just the best time. Um, and many, when it started out in the 50s, many of the teams were sponsored by local businesses. And this is a 1953 Lumberjacks, a Three Oaks, mm -hmm. sponsored by Three Oaks Lumber and Coal Company. And it was important that the sponsors, they had a suit and a tie on. It was important, baseball was that, had that kind of feel for it. Um, Randy Carver, and you know Randy, did you know Randy? He was a coaching Little League when I was uh, in Little League. He uh, coached his brothers, Kyle and Kent. Just a great guy. Played on the River Valley baseball team, was captain his senior year, little league coach. And uh, Carver Park in Three Oaks is named after him. He went to Vietnam during the season um, and toward the end of the season came back. Um, and we had a funeral for him. Um, just a wonderful, wonderful guy, but learned a lot of things from little league. So he died in Vietnam. He died in Vietnam, yep. And the Carver Park in Three Oaks is named after him at the, at the corner. A great guy. That's me on the left, Brother Pete on the right, the 1967 <laughs> Cubs. Um, we collected cards. And most people did. While it was a hobby, we collected cards. We went to the Spotlight Grocery at the corner of Oak and Pawpaw. And it's, it's a duplex now, um, apartments. But that was the neighborhood grocery store, and we had um, a tough family that lived about a half a block there. We always had to get past those older kids because uh, it, it was kind of a rite of passage, you know, if you could make it past. Their mom says, go get a gallon of milk, and it's like, man, I hope that family, those kids aren't outside, you know, because <laughs> you never knew what was going to happen. But anyway, um, tobacco cards were the first cards, of course, and uh, came with packs of tobacco. The Honus Wagner card, of course, is famous. He, he, they were printing those cards, and um, they printed a few of them. He says, wait a minute, I'm not for tobacco. I don't think it's good for you. So they stopped printing. So there's you know a dozen or so of those cards around, and they when one comes up for auction, it sells for millions. These were 1914 blankets that also came with tobacco. And uh, they're wonderful. And, the gentleman that lived two doors down from us had the hardware store in Three Oaks, Mr. Potts. And we'd go into the hardware store and they had a barrel of bats you'd play around with. And one day when I was in there, in the 60s, he reached under the counter and he said, here, take these. And he gave me a stack of those blankets that oh, I wow. still have today. Yep. Post-World War II, the two card companies were Tops, and this is the 52 Mantle that is the kind of the holy grail of cards. And Bowman. And of course, TV was just becoming new, so they made a card looking like the TV. Uh -huh. 1955 Bowman's, and that, of course, is Al Kaline. Um, the first card in the 52 set was Handy Andy Pafko. And the number one card is always a little more valuable nowadays because it sat at the beginning of your stack, and finding one in good condition is a little tougher because it might have rubber bands, marks on it, and such. 
he spent the last two years of his life in Bridgman in a care facility. And I got with the family and was able to spend a couple of hours with him, a couple separate visits. And I took an album of cards each time and we just flipped through the pages. I didn't want his autograph, didn't want a picture. I just, the things that were in his mind at the time were things that had been there forever. And he could go back and tell me about these different players and it was just fascinating. Andy Pafko. Um, Tops had a monopoly in baseball cards until 1980. You buy a pack of cards and you get a stick of gum. Mm -hmm. Well, other companies sued Tops saying, you know, we should be able to make cards too. They won the suit and the result was they could print cards but they couldn't have a stick of bubble gum in them. <laughs> Tops was the official bubble gum card company. So, you had Tops, then you had Donruss, Upper Deck, Score, Fleer, you had all these companies. And the market just got saturated and people didn't know what to collect and it became more of a business. Mm -hmm. And so there are boxes of cards right now from the 80s that you can buy for $5 on eBay because they're just overproduced. So. It was a hobby, and then it, baby boom card collecting was great. It was affordable, it was tradable, collectible, it was issued by series. In other words, if there were 600 cards, the first month you buy the first one through 100, and then you'd wait for your grocer to get in the next series. All oh, the new series in, so you'd go and buy some of the second series. Until the 70s, then they started issuing them all at once. Uh, the special <laughs> smell of a fresh pack. Some wanted the gum, some wanted the cards. It was it was a hobby and not an investment. I have a we question. would go through the neighborhood. Yes. And regarding the cards, did they go into like a studio to have the photograph taken? How did the pictures get to the card to the point where the cards? Uh, Tops had the card companies had contracts either with Major League Baseball, some players in the fifties. Um, Ted Williams was one that was noteworthy, had separate contracts with like maybe Sears and Roebuck or Rawlings, and it prohibited them, or there was a clause in there that they couldn't get their, their card. For instance, Williams played from, you know, like 40 to 60 or something, 1940, 1960. His first Topps card was 1954. And in honor of that, they, the first card in the set was Ted Williams, and the last card in the set was Ted Williams. Stan Musial also had uh, a contract and he had very few cards in the 50s. But uh, they took pictures at spring training or at the ball game. Uh, okay. They arranged times, photographers did, yep. Thank you. Yep. And to get packs of cards, I mean, let's face it, they were five cents a pack back then. How many cards were in there? Uh, 10, 10 cards for five cents. and. We'd scarf, we'd find pot bottles, and it was three cent deposit back then, you know, and then you get a penny, that's two bags of cards. You had paper route money, which we did that for sure. Is that you? That, that's not me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I had baskets, not a bag. And then, of course, they became valuable. Mom, what did you do with my baseball cards? I used to be a millionaire until my mom threw out my baseball cards. <laughs> It went from a hobby to a business. What, what, what was the time period of that, would you say? That um, I would say when baby boomers got to about 40 years old, <laughs> I would say. Uh, I, I would say it's in a, they went up in value. I think maybe at the same time the, the, all the production happened. So those, those cards that were older, stayed, became more valuable, because there weren't a lot of them, I do believe. Um, now they have conventions. Conventions, yeah, there's one coming up in Chicago, but this was uh, the last one that I attended. And uh, the, the money that changes hands there is, it's not five cents a pack there anymore. Um, there's special cards, like Mickey Mantle's been dead for several years, but there's a Mickey Mantle card, upper deck, a hologram, you might get that in a pack, but the packs are now instead of five cents, are fifteen dollars. 
Is that still a piece of gum in there? Uh, in the top, sir, I believe is gum. Still in the top. Yes. Ten of them, too? Also uh, ten? ten cards, I believe, yep. Autographs. Here's Pete Rose's autograph. And he, for an extra few bucks, when you go to see him, he will write, oh Sorry gosh. I bet on baseball, Pete Rose. <laughs> wow. um, and then to authenticate, uh, authenticate an autograph, it costs even more. I wrote a letter to Jackie Robinson in 1972 and sent three items, and I sent a return stamp self-addressed envelope with it. I received it back and they were all signed. I was just thrilled. I took it to the convention, the national convention. And I've looked at Jackie's autograph, I've looked at mine. Uh, we can't authenticate that, I, we don't think, we think maybe the housekeeper signed that or oh. someone else. I said, really? Yeah, yeah, I said, okay. I still think they're real. I still have the envelope that he sent them back to me in, but that's... How, how do they authenticate them? I mean, what would they do? Well, you have to be a, an expert. Oh. You know, they have experts. <laughs> and they, and they, they get out a microscope, and the question was, how do you authenticate it? Someone that's an expert um, who, maybe someone that lives more than 300 miles away from where the convention is. I don't know what the expert is, but... Um, but are they like a handwriting expert? Yes, yep. Yep. Yes. And you get the cards graded, too. They look at your card at these conventions. You can send them in, and it's on a 1 to 10 basis. And the higher the grade, the more valuable. Yeah. Where's the sport going? The baby boom is over, so you can't have a neighborhood pickup game. Travel teams are picking up more talented players, and often those players and families have more allegiance to the travel team than their school team. Mm -hmm. And kids just don't play catch anymore. They don't. I, I, I started coaching the league when I was 18. Of course, I, then I had my career, and, and when it got over, someone asked me to coach. I said, yeah, I'll coach. So I went out there and worked with the kids, and they, they couldn't catch and throw well, so I worked on that. Well, after practice, the mitt, they get in the van, and the mitt goes underneath the van seat, you know, and they get in the van. And then we have practice four days later, and I see him get out of the van, and I see him reach under there, and that mitt's in the same exact place. They haven't played any catch. And so it's, it's, it's different. All of us played catch. All of us in this room played catch, played rundown, played 500. Pick. We did something, uh, and that just doesn't happen anymore. There's no more broken windows. <laughs> we all broke windows. We all broke, oh, how we, oh, gather the money up. Yep, we gotta go talk to Mr. Smith. We broke his window. And they were okay with that. They knew kids were out playing. They knew that was part of the trade-off. And uh, it's just part of childhood. And here's today. Here's today. Right here. And glove endorsements. What name was in your baseball glove? This is a picture from the museum, too. But these guys that endorse these mitts, you know, they probably got a few hundred bucks, and it, it meant a lot. Um, you don't see any mitts that are endorsed by today's players because you can't afford to pay those guys to do that. Well, I'm not going to do that. They, they, it should cost too much money, way too much money. I ran into Gene Fodge at a card show. He's from South Bend. And I saw him at a card show. That's probably in the 80s, I guess. And he told me, he has played a couple years, but after his first full year with the Cubs, uh, he and his wife wanted to buy a house. So they went to the bank to get a, get a loan. They wouldn't give him a loan because they said baseball was a part-time job. <laughs> Compare that to today. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, my good fortune, I grew up watching Ernie Banks, and you know, the reason many of us on this side of the lake became Cub fans is because when we got home from school, the Cubs were on TV. They played during the day. They weren't night games. And uh, Ernie Banks was born January 31st, 1931, the same exact day and year as my dad on the left. And these guys are in their early 20s here. My dad was stationed in Germany, and uh, Bertie was in the Army for two years as well. And I'm going to take a little break, 
Pass out some Cracker Jacks, then I'm going to talk about the Negro. Very exciting, isn't it? Yes, we are still being recorded. So we are still being recorded here. But how, so, how many people know Mo um, Kyles? You know what? Mo Kyles, Moses Kyles? Yeah. Moses Kyles. Moses Kyles from school, of course. Teacher, Mrs. Ryder is here for that. So, that's kind of interesting. And then, as uh, we mentioned, Chef Patrick, his mother is also a patron here at the center. So, that's exciting. And, you know, I do my one, my neighbor's daughter. And now lives down by Fort Wayne, and her um, boyfriend, significant other, he is actually in the minor leagues. Oh. So it's kind of fun for me to listen to what he's saying and saying, you know, people's not paying t playing catch. I remember, you know, my neighbor, the daughter, and her boyfriend out there playing catch. But he's right; we don't see a lot of that anymore. So it's kind of interesting. So I hope you keep learning um, some information. How many people here collected baseball cards? One, two, three, four. Excellent. Yeah. Diana, Do you still have them? Ask how many mothers threw away the collection? <laughs> how many mothers threw away collections? Did your mom did? Uh, no, no. That could have been you up there. That's, <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Your father collected? No, no. Hey, yeah. There's five of us running around. <laughs> She's saying that he burned the cards. So yeah, it's very exciting. Uh, dis disclaimer, I, I tried some of these yesterday, so did my wife. They're okay, but they're about two weeks past their expiration date. That's my disclaimer, eat at your own risk. <laughs> and you know, this the people that own this company, have a home in Lakeside and have been there forever. Uh, she was yeah, she, she was here. Um, she was here and did a um, yes, yes, the Cracker Jack lady. Yeah, yeah. Yep. She's been at the museum too. Do they still have prizes in the Cracker Jacks? Yes, so. You got it. Does it? Yeah, you go to the website. Aside. And it, oh. You'll see. Yeah, it's it's a little goofy, but oh. even that has changed. Yeah, playing games. games. <laughs> yeah. Get to swallow them today. Oh, yeah. Well, the playing games because that's what kids do. There's an app for that. <laughs> All right. How many people would go to like South, not South, but Chicago over to Detroit to the Tigers to watch a baseball game when they were younger? Oh, I was <laughs> hey. Yeah, I remember going to the White Sox and the old stadium and then Cubs downtown, of course. So have you been to a game lately? My dad was a White Sox fan. Yes. My grandpa was a Detroit Tigers fan. Whoa. Okay, so they. Absolutely. Yeah, so we got the American League and the National League. Well, they, my dad used to get the tickets, and he would take my grandpa and me, and we'd go to Chicago to the White Sox game when Detroit played there. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of fun. We used to go downtown and have dinner. Yeah. Now, is they, are they American or are they American National League? Both American League, okay. No. Cubs are National League. Cubs are National League. Yes. And, and Sox are American League. Right. Okay. Oh, okay. That's where I got it. He's a Cub fan. Uh, I grew up on the South Side. Yes. And, like, it's kind of required that you're a, a Sox fan. <laughs> but my mom, who you know, right, right. was a Cubs fan. For some reason, her family, even though she was from the South Side, were Cubs fans. So we always watched the Cubs. And we're kind of the outcasts. <laughs> yeah. My mom started failing with a Cubs fan, and yeah. I remember a ball game on TV all the time. Uh, well, I used to babysit my daughter. She was a little baby. I'm there in front of the TV when the Cubs were on. <laughs> the night the Cubs won the World Series, she called me on the phone crying. Did oh. she really? Oh, oh, nice. oh that's sweet. Sweet. Oh, nice. Oh, 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 oh,
Yeah. <laughs> but that's still a good story. Yeah. Uh, Donnelly Love. Well, that's one part. Are you ready, Gary? Sure. I'm yeah. going to hand this back over to him. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for the record, Jack. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Sorry, they're. I, I bought them for another event. And I, I know I have some more, but they're still good. <laughs> um, blacks and baseball. Baseball reflects a lot of where our country is much throughout our history, really. Um, unbeknownst to many, the first African American to play was Moses Fleetwood Walker. He was at Oberlin College, uh, then transferred to the University of Michigan. He integrated baseball 63 years before Jackie. He transferred to Oberlin in Ohio to the University of Michigan in 1882. While he was playing for Oberlin, they were playing in South Bend, and the restaurant there refused to serve him. That's a little local history, too. He helped uh, lead the team of Michigan to a 10-3 record. He was signed by Toledo. Cap Anson was a racist, and uh, he did not want his team, he would not allow his team to play uh, Toledo if, if uh, Fleetwood was on the team. but wouldn't let him take the field. Um, they worked through that. Uh, in 1884, the American Association was formed. It was a forerunner of the American League. And on May 1st, 1884, Fleetwood Walker integrated baseball. Of course, that didn't last long. He played one solid year in the majors. His pitcher and teammate was Tony Mullane. And Tony would say, you know, the catcher has to flash the sign. And at that speed, the catcher has to know what pitch is coming to do a good job of catching it. He didn't even pay any attention to the signs because, because Walker was black. He's not going to tell me what to do and what pitch to throw. Yeah. So consequently, there were a lot of pass balls and injuries. Um, he had to work his way back. In 1889, the National League and the uh, American Association unofficially banned blacks and filed Reconstruction Jim Crow laws. Uh, and that's until Jackie. In 1891, in self-defense, Moses uh, Fleetwood Walker uh, killed a man that was att that attacked him. He was acquitted for second-degree murder. He wrote a book in 1908 about the black and white existence, and he was alienated really from his life. But from life, he just was disgusted. Um, but he paid a price. The Negro League was established by Ruth Foster in 1920. Actually, the anniversary, 102nd anniversary, was two days ago. It was all over Facebook, the, the sites that I, pages I belong to. In Kansas City, Missouri, that's Ruth Foster. The Negro League's Baseball Museum, established in 1990, is just two blocks away from the inaugural field. And Ruth Foster's saying was, we are the ship, all else the sea. Uh, the Negro National League was strong from 1920 until the eve of the Great Depression. Many teams folded, only the strong survived, and black baseball rose again in 1933 with the formation of the new Negro National League followed by the Negro American League. And in 1933, the first East-West All-Star game was played, which rivaled the major league in attendance and popularity. That was at Comiskey Park. And oftentimes, the Negro Leagues would uh, rent out the uh, major league stadium while the major league team was on the road. That's how they did their schedule. There are a lot of stars that came out of the Negro Leagues. Um, and it stayed strong through the 30s and early 40s. The 1942 attendance was over 3 million. Opponents included the House of David, which is a whole other story, but they had tremendous teams. Um, first star was Josh Gibson. He was the second highest paid behind Satchel Paige. And Satchel, Satchel had sayings about all these guys, and I'm going to share them with you. Uh, Satchel said, while you're looking for his weakness, he'll hit 45 home runs. <laughs> he was a catcher. He died at age 38 of uh, alcohol. Um, he was referred to as the Black Babe Ruth, or Babe was the white Josh Gibson. Yeah. <laughs> That's another way of saying that. Cool Papa Bell. He was the fastest player ever. Played a very shallow center field. He was a switch hitter. Again, Satchel. Satchel was pitching. Satchel said, one time he had a line drive right past my ear. I turned around, and the ball hit his rear while he was sliding into second. 
Another one said, just said he could turn off the light switch at night and be in bed before the lights went out. That's how fast he was. Cool Papa Bell. Norman Turkey Stearns. His arms flapped as he ran, but he got his nickname, he said, because he had a pot belly as a child. Satchel said he was one of the greatest hitters we ever had. He was as good as Josh and as good as anybody who ever played ball. He played with the Detroit Stars at Hamtramck Stadium, which is finishing up a renovation and is on the National Register of Historic Places, Hamtramck Stadium. Um, and uh, it's one of five remaining Negro League fields. Uh, Turkey Stearns' daughter, Joyce Stearns Thompson, I've become friends with her on Facebook, and uh, just a delightful person, and is thrilled that this uh, stadium is being redone. And it's quite a, quite a piece of work, but if you're over in the Detroit area sometime, well worth seeing. Leroy Satchel Page, pitched with and against the House of David. He went where the money was. He pitched everywhere, everywhere. And these are his six rules for staying young, and they appeared on his business card. Number one, avoid fried meats, which angry up the blood. Number two, if your stomach disputes you, lie down and pacify it with cool thoughts. <laughs> Number three, keep the juices flowing by jangling around gently as you move. Number four, go very light on the vices, such as carrying on in society. The social ramble ain't restful. Number five, Avoid running at all times. <laughs> and number six, probably the most famous, don't look back, something might be gaining on you. <laughs> Satchel Page. Um, 1944 was a, a key year. It was the demise of the Negro Leagues. But this guy, Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis, he was a politician too, but he was the first commissioner of baseball. He was born November 20th, 1866. He was a U.S. federal judge from 1905 to 1922. He was the first commissioner of baseball from 1920 until his death in 1944. And yes, I picked that picture of him on purpose. <laughs> uh, he was a racist, and, uh, but quietly kept blacks out of the major leagues. But when he died, that was a big a big turning point. Uh, he wasn't there anymore to do that. Additional factors to Jackie playing in that first game. The prowess of boxer Joe Lewis. This guy's an athlete. This guy can do anything. The performance of Jesse Owens at the 1936 Olympics in Berlin. He lived in Union Pier for a while too, by the way. Jesse Owens? Really? Uh, blacks and whites fighting side by side in World War II. And I, I don't know a lot about World War II, but I don't think they were elbow to elbow. I think there was a, you know, different battalions and such. But blacks were fighting World War II for the same reason whites were. We're all Americans. And also, the desire for major league owners to have rosters of the best possible players. I mean, it costs them zillions of dollars now, but they wanted it back then, too. Branch Ricky and Jackie Robinson made it happen. No, who was Branch? That was Richie. Branch Rickey was the owner of the Dodgers. And uh, if you see the movie 42, it's playing a lot this month on uh, PBS even. Movie 42, that was Jackie Robinson's number. Very good movie. Um, and the, the gentleman that played Jackie Robinson, help me. He died of cancer. Young black actor. Oh, is he the one who played um, oh, the Black Panther? Yes. Yep. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. He played Jackie Robinson. And there was a gentleman assigned to Jackie Robinson during his first year. And his name was Wendell Smith. And I don't know if you can remember, folks, but I met him at the ballpark when I was a kid. But he worked for, he was wrote for the Pittsburgh Courier, the Chicago Defender, of black newspapers. Um, but then he landed a job with WGN, and this is a picture of him here. But Branch Rickey hired him to be alongside Jackie for that whole first season. And that's him on the, on the left in that left picture. And just a wonderful guy. And he's portrayed in that movie too, not high profile. But uh, always been one of my favorite characters and um, died young, but uh, 
You'd see him on the news at WGN. We'd see him at the ballpark, too. Wendell Smith. And there's Jackie and Branch once again signing April 15, 1947. And uh, brotherly love, this is a little sarcastic. Now, Pee Wee Reese was a terrific teammate to Jackie. Terrific. Arm around him, held him up. Jackie didn't need a lot of help standing up because he was a, strong in his own route. But this was a, a press uh, arranged photo. The Phillies, the city of brotherly love, and Ben Chapman, their uh, manager, they were just terrible to Jackie. Terrible. Uh, just said the worst things to him from the dugout, swearing and such. And well, it, it got so much publicity that it was arranged that they'd have a kind of a get together and get their pictures taken like they were getting along okay. And, um, Chapman, you can't see any egg on his face there, but there should be. Um, what I decided to do for you today is I am going to show you, there were only 16 teams back then eight in each league, but I'm going to show you and tell you a little bit about, and I, I, I'll go as fast as I can here, but I, about each of the color barrier breaking players for each team. I just don't think they get much ink. You know, you know about Jackie Robinson, but what about the rest of the teams? So, the first one in the American League, there's Jackie, was Larry Doby on July 5th, 1947. First black in the American League, second black overall. He was the second black manager. He was also the first ABA slash NBA basketball black. Um, he was an all-star the first seven of his eight years. He served in World War II. He was a home run leader in 1952 and made it to the Hall of Fame in 1998. Larry Doby. Hank Thompson. He started out with the Kansas City Monarchs. He was a second baseman. He had a cup of coffee in 1947. He and Monty Irvin were the first also for the New York Giants. Uh, but this was St. Louis Browns, um, who later became, in, in uh, 50, 50, 54, the uh, Baltimore Orioles. They moved to Baltimore. Um, tough upbringing, machine gunner in World War II. He had a penchant for trouble, in and out of prison. Um, there were talks of a movie at one time star starring Sidney Poitier playing him. Um, that never came to be. Um, he died early at age 43. Hank Thompson. Monty Irvin, New York Giants. He was the choice of the Negro League owners to break the barrier. He starred with the Newark Eagles. He was a great player. Hall of Fame in 1973. He said, baseball's a game you play for nothing. And I'm so happy the Lord gave me a little ability because it allowed me to meet a lot of good people and see so many exciting places. After he retired from uh, the big leagues, he worked in the commissioner's office for uh, 20 years or so. Sam Jethro, Boston Braves. And they eventually moved to Milwaukee to become the Milwaukee Braves. And then they went to Atlanta where they became the Atlanta Braves. But that's the history there. His nickname was the Jet and it was said he could outrun the Word of God. <laughs> he played with the Cleveland Buckeyes, played the East-West Black All-Star Game four times. He hit 393 in 1945 and was the oldest ever Major League Rookie of the Year in 1950. And there he is, Minnie Minoso. The Cuban <laughs> Comet was the first Latin superstar today one third of the players are Latin American in the big leagues. He was the Latin Jackie Robinson. In 11 major league seasons, he hit over 300 eight times, appeared in nine all star games. Bob Trice, Philadelphia Athletics, uh, who became the Kansas City Athletics and then became the Oakland Athletics. <laughs> um, he played for the Homestead Grays in the Negro Leagues. He was a good hitting pitcher, spent two years in the Navy. Had a brief career in the big leagues, easy going. Um, he sent himself down to the minors because he didn't think he was playing well enough. He never regained his form and appeared briefly again in 1955. <clears throat> Bernie Banks, Mr. Cub. He was with the Kansas City Monarchs, two years in the Army. He played shortstop, first base, and was clearly one of the greatest ambassadors uh, to the game. This is Kurt Roberts for the Pittsburgh Pirates. He played in the same high school as Bill Russell, 
played basketball for the Celtics, and Frank Robinson. He was with the Kansas City Monarchs. Um, Ranch Rickey was general manager of the Pirates when he brought him up, and he gave him the same speech he gave Jackie, be calm. Uh, Kurt was a great mentor to Roberto Clemente. He only had a three-year career. Uh, he was hit by a drunk driver while changing a tire and was killed at age 40. Kurt Roberts. Tom Alston, St. Louis Cardinals, April 13, 1954. Now, just saying, it's been years since Jackie Robinson broke the color line, and these teams are just getting on, on board with this. And this is 1954. Tom Alston, uh, St. Louis Cardinals. Mr. Bush, who owned the, uh, the beer company and the Cardinals, he was no civil rights crusader. He decided, for capitalistic reasons, to put blacks in the stands to sell more beer. That was his thinking. We get a black player or two here, we get blacks to get the ballpark, we can sell some more beer. Uh, Tom had no high school team. He played in the Navy in 1944. He earned his bachelor's in 1951. He appeared in 91 games over two seasons. He suffered from schizophrenia. And uh, later in his life, Joe Garagiola assisted him with getting mental and financial help and also arranged for him to throw out the first pitch for the Cardinals in 1990. He died three years later at the age of 67. Two-handed approach there, too. Isn't that rare? That is rare, yes. Yep. Chuck Harmon, Cincinnati Reds. His dad was a teacher in a one-room schoolhouse in Washington, Indiana. And Chuck was a state basketball champion player in 1941 and 1942. He spent two years in the Navy. He roomed with Larry Doby at Great Lakes Naval Academy. Uh, he toured with the Indianapolis Clowns, and uh, Goose Tatum played with them at the time, too, who played with the Globetrotters basketball player. And they referred to Chuck as Charlie Fine. They called him Charlie Fine on the roster also, so he didn't lose his uh, amateur status for college. So he had a, a second identity. Um, he played at the University of Toledo from 54 to 56, uh, and, and then he, uh, after baseball, he was with the Hamilton County Court System for 28 years, and he was known by everybody, set a wonderful example, and did so much for Cincinnati. That's Chuck Harmon. It's a good story. Carlos Paula, Washington Senators. He, unfortunately, was the butt of jokes in Washington and nearby Boston for decades. In a short span as a Washington Senator, Carlos achieved inordinate notoriety for his adventurous outfielding. Um, he still batted 299 in 1955, but any ball that he missed was magnified because he was black. Any ball that he missed. White players weren't judged like he was, but he suffered a lot of discrimination. He died at age 54 in Miami. Here's one you know, uh, Elson Howard, New York Yankees, April 14th, 1955. He was a child in St. Louis when Jackie broke the color barrier. He had offers from Illinois, Michigan State, and the University of Michigan to play football. Uh, the Cardinals and Mr. Bush were not ready. I mean, he's right in their backyard. He roomed with Ernie Banks for the Kansas City Monarchs. He was sold to the Yankees and spent the summer of 1950 as an outfielder for the Muskegon Clippers. Yes, Muskegon, Michigan Clippers. When Cleveland won the pennant in 1954 with Doby, with Larry Doby, the black guy, and they, they beat out the Yankees, the Yankees decided we better get a black person in here to try to win the pennant again. And he was converted from an outfielder to a catcher. He died in 1980 at age 51 from heart problems. His number 32 was retired uh, in 1984, Elson Howard. John Kennedy, Philadelphia Phillies. He was compared to Ernie Banks, but he only batted five times in the big leagues and he was done. The Phillies were the last National League club to integrate. The very last one. And they just wanted to get it over with. They wanted to get a black player on their roster. That was their angle. He played for the Birmingham Barons, the Kansas City Monarchs, and then the Phillies. He had a great spring, but the team found out that he was 
30 years old and not the 22 that he claimed. It was pretty common for baseball players to say they were younger than they were, especially back at this time. Uh, therefore, the Phillies traded for another shortstop and then demoted John. He played in, he played in 40 and over leagues uh, until he was in his 70s in Florida. Oh, he could still play. Ozzie Virgil, Detroit Tigers, June 6, 1958. He emigrated to the United States with his parents at age 13. He spent two years in the Marines and then baseball. In the fall of 56, he played for the Giants, who had already, of course, uh, integrated, and in the spring of 58 for the Tigers. He coached for many teams after his playing career. His son also played in the major leagues, Ozzie Virgil. Bumpsy Green. 1959, 12 years after Jackie integrated, Boston finally had a black player. 12 years! In April 1945, here's a pre-story, with pressure from a city councilman in Boston, the Red Sox reluctantly held a tryout for three black players, one of which was Jackie Robinson. Players never heard back. Green was 13 years old when Jackie made the bigs. And owner Yawkey said during this whole 12 years, well, we can't find a single player to help us. He spent four years with the Red Sox and his last year with the Mets. Um, and during that time too, you can read a lot about it, but when they went to spring training in Scottsdale, Arizona, he couldn't stay in the hotel with the rest of the team. What year? Uh, that would be uh, 62, 63. Yeah. Yeah. He had to go to Phoenix, and then the, the team shuttled him back and forth. Not allowed in Scottsdale. He coached high school teams in California. He died in 2019 at age 85. And uh, in an interview, they said, he was asked, when I was with the Red Sox, what was fair? He said in an interview, with the New York Times in 1998. He said, I didn't have to leave California and go to Boston to be discriminated against. Oh. Pretty straight. 1959. Emmett Ashford, some of you remember him, first black umpire. He was the first black president in his high school, first black editor of the school newspaper, first black cashier in a local market that previously hired blacks only as janitors and stockers. He ran out to his position every game when it was his, his turn to umpire. If he was umping uh, at second base, he broad jumped the mound when he ran out. And if he was umping first or third, he always, he always ran to the wall, the outfield wall, and came back to his position. <laughs> and when there was a fly ball in the outfield, he ran out there to see the guy catch it. He was nearby, Emmett Ashford. First black coach was Buck O'Neill, the Chicago Cubs in 1962. And if you watch Ken Burns baseball, you fall in love with this guy. He's just like everybody's grandpa that you'd want to have. He's just a super guy. He was a Kansas City Monarchs player and manager, coach of the Cubs, player coach, mentor, and ambassador. He was instrumental in the forming of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in Kansas City, uh, which, which I have not visited yet, but I'm looking forward to doing that. Sir? Yep. We, we've been there. You have. And he's over there. Well, he's he was. Not there. Well, well, not anymore, yeah. actually, but right. we were there several years ago. The museum's incredible. Um, oh, wow. There. Incredible. Yeah. Terrific. But he was, like you said, just like one of the guys. I mean, hey, how you doing? And what's going on? And yeah. where are you from? And just amazing. Well, I'm glad, you, I'm glad you've been there and it was a good experience. It's a, I understand it's just a great place. You would love it. Yeah. You absolutely <laughs> yeah. love it. Yeah. Thank you. First black manager was Frank Robinson for the Cleveland Indians in 1975. He was the most valuable player in both leagues. He was traded from the Reds to the Orioles, and that put the Orioles over the top for those great teams that Baltimore had. Uh, when he became player manager, he homered in his first game. <laughs> yeah, Frank Robinson. Um, there's another baseball museum well, there's a Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in Kansas City. Get there if you can. Um, I've, I've been in touch with them a few times about a few different things, and they're great people, and it's a great place, and growing in popularity. 
And the Jazz Museum is somewhere near there too, right, I think? I don't remember that. Which one? Jazz. I don't remember Okay. That. Um, there's also the Birmingham Negro Southern League Museum that Liz and I, my wife Liz and I, stumbled upon. And she said, there's a baseball museum. Okay, well, we're winding through. We're heading towards Gulf Shores. A few years ago, we stopped there. And it was a terrific place. Um, industrial leagues had uh, were very popular, like slow pitch softball leagues were in the uh, 70s and 80s around here. All the guys playing that played little league. Well, the industrial leagues were were huge, and Birmingham kept a viable industrial leagues for a number of years. I took a picture of this because Charlie Finley's autograph is on this scorecard, um, and he owned the Oakland A's and had a place in the port nearby the port. I try to weave local things into this. <laughs> Doing a great job. And these are, while well, we were there, <laughs> these guys, the last of the Birmingham Black Barons were there having lunch and they did a program for a, a local elementary school. He just happened to be there. And they, they asked to get their picture taken with me. They said, Here, here's how you gotta, they told me how to stand and the whole bit. But we were there for, visiting them for probably an hour. Just a, a great visit. Um, and those guys played for the Black Barons. Uh, the guy right behind me played for the Monarchs. Detroit Stars, uh, they played in the Negro Leagues, but then finished up their careers in the Industrial League. Um, so the shirt, we meet every August 19th to celebrate Eddie Goodell's appearance in a major league game. Bill Veck, who is arguably the best owner baseball has ever had, with he's for the fan, as a gimmick, set, uh, sent Eddie Goodell uh, up to bat in a game on August 19, 1951. A gentleman out in Washington State decided to commemorate that appearance, and he opened the Eddie Goodell Society out there in Spokane. I got wind of it. We visited out there when we were out west. And uh, I decided to open the Southwestern Michigan chapter of the Eddie Goodell Society. That's one of the meetings right there in our house. The last meeting was at the library in Three Oaks on the third floor. Mr. Dalrymple was there. And we had a uh, trivia contest. Had, I think, six or seven teams of five, four or five, and another 30, 40 people in the, just taking it in. And uh, the moderator was uh, Dave Gumpert, who pitched for the Cubs and the Tigers and is, is a friend. And he, at intermission, told some baseball stories. And uh, there, there were, it, was, it was a great evening, but we'll do it again, August 19th. These, there's forms for these shirts if you want to order one, because they're about the coolest shirt. I, I order them when I get a bunch of requests, which I haven't gotten any of them, but they're, I, they're 15 bucks. There's Eddie on the back. Um, and we sort of hold a eulogy and the celebration of his life because he did something all of us would have wanted to do. He appeared in a major league game. If but just one time, he got up to bat. And uh, he walked on four pitches. Um, uh, Bob Swift was the catcher. The pitcher was Bob Kane. And uh, uh, Eddie appeared again in 1959 uh, when Beck owned the Sox. Or no, 61 when Beck owned the Sox. He worked as a uh, in television a little bit, you know, got jobs where he could. Beck helped him out. He was a riveter during World War II because he could get to places where people could, you know, uh, and uh, kind of a character. Was an alcoholic and, and uh, died a tragic life. Um, lived in Chicago area, but uh, we celebrate his life every August 19th, and you all are welcome to be there and uh, just. Like us on Facebook, Biggest Little Baseball Museum, and uh, or call the live. It's every August 19th. It's probably going to be there again. It's on a Friday. Uh, and the tractor is a 1957 Farmall Cub. Another story. <laughs> when I got that run, we have I mow about four acres. Gotta go eat. Um, I decided to dress it up like in honor of Bernie Banks. So it says Mr. Cub on the side. There's a Cub C for the hood ornament. And in the mower guard, you can't see it, but it says Banks, number 14. 
And we had a garage sale years ago, and a, and a guy said, uh, he was, I had some Cub stuff there. He says, oh, Cub fan? I said, yeah. He says, uh, well, Ernie Banks and I play golf together. I said, wow, that's cool. I said, let me show you this tractor. So I showed him the tractor, and we sent some pictures to him. And I was home. I worked at, at River Valley Schools. I was home one Christmas break, and the phone rings. I said, hello. I says, yeah, I'm looking at a picture of uh, some pictures of a tractor here. I said, okay. I didn't know who it was. I said, is, he says, is this Gary? I said, yeah. He said, this is Ernie Banks. He called my house. <laughs> he called my house. And we talked for 20 minutes. And I told him about my dad having the same birthday. And I know a lot about him. And uh, anyway, it was a great visit. Fast forward to that summer, we hosted a family reunion. And I was out mowing. And everybody went to the beach, but I had mowing to do. And I was push mowing around the house. And I, I came back in the house after mowing. And, my wife's cousin says, um, did you borrow somebody's mower? I said, no. She says, she takes out a piece of paper, she says, and Ernie Banks called, and he asked if you were, I told him you were out mowing, and he asked if you were using his mower. Is, is that it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'm like, I'm like, oh, okay, be cool, Gary, you know. I said, what did he say? Well, he's in South Bend and he, he wanted you to have dinner with him, but he said he might try back later. I said, okay. I said, do you know that name, Ernie Banks? And she says, is he a ball player or something? I said, yeah, yeah he is. And he didn't call back, um, but it's a fun story. <laughs> but anyway, she would have been a good, like, Wife's cousin would have been a good juror for the O.J. Simpson trial. Oh, okay. She wouldn't have known who he was or anything. Yeah. Shortly after he passed away, I put together a song and a video. It's on YouTube. Just Google "Thanks Ernie Banks." You'll, you'll get a hoot out of it. Uh, and I, it's not me playing a fancy guitar. That's my friend Don. But um, anyway, it's, it's okay. This is Eddie Goodell, August 19, 1951, in his appearance. Um, I was alive when they won the trophy in 2016, and uh, I got to be by the trophy too. My friend Larry and I dropped out of college. We were at Kalamazoo College. We dropped out after the first year. I went back to Western. He started working at Sarkozy Bakery in Kalamazoo and learning about yeast and brewing things. Do you ever have a Bell's beer? That's Larry Bell. <laughs> my old college roommate. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's him. He just retired. I have this at the museum, too. Can of corn. You don't hear that expression too much anymore. But a can of corn, when we were playing, someone hit a routine pop-up, and you'd hear somebody say, can of corn. Well, it's a routine fly ball hit to an outfielder. And the term goes back to the late 1800s when clerks at grocery stores were looking for an easier way to reach canned goods on the high shelves. They started using long, hooked sticks to pull them down. And after dropping the cans toward them, they'd catch them in their apron, oh. just like a fly ball. <laughs> Can of corn! <laughs> so if we all want to start a, like a new trend to get this next generation educated when you're at a game this year, when you see a pop-up, yeah. can of corn! <laughs> Have a look it up. Uh, plan a visit to the biggest little baseball museum in Three Oaks, Michigan. Um, this picture is taken of the Three Oaks Greens, about 1910, and this building is no longer there. Um, but if you come to the, from the stoplight, come to the railroad tracks in Three Oaks, um, go over the tracks and turn left, and go down about mm, 100 yards, bang, that's where that building would have been. And the ball field, was right here. The first baseline was right along the side of the building. Look at the grandstand. It was important. It was important. I, I would liken it to how basketball, you remember those great Buchanan Buck teams in the 70s and 80s? Uh, everybody showed up. That's what this was back then. There's a train car right here. And there's people watching the game from inside the train car. You got the catbird seats up here on top of the building. 
Um, but it was it was it was a big deal. We are located in the nicest building within a hundred miles. You've been in that building. Beautiful. It, it is a tremendous building. Um, you can like us on Facebook. We are open during regular library hours. While you're in town, wait till the weather gets a little better. Check out the region of Three Oaks Museum. That's 500 feet behind us. And then the Three Oaks Bicycle Museum is 500 feet on the other side, kind of by Dewey Cannon Park, just behind the Vickers Theater. And admission to all, free. It's free. And when you're leaving Three Oaks after your visit, this is Oak Meadow Farm looking towards Moline and Buchanan. This barn is still here, and the creamery is still on the left, but it's, it's wooden at this time. Um, and there's uh, someone coming down the road in the horse and buggy. You're going to have to wait until the cattle get out of the way. That, that was taken about 1910, looking towards Moline and Buchanan. That's US 12 right there. <laughs> That's all, folks. Oh, I, yeah.